Hello and welcome guys. In this video we are going to talk about going from 0 to 3D in Webflow using FinSuite DevLink and we talk about the Blender and stuff like that. So today we have a special guest Federico Walla. He is behind the scenes of the entire FinSuite website and he is our special superpower for making this website possible. Hello, Sergey. Thank you for having me. I'm a developer and I do, I love 3D and I love real time 3D on the web. And I also do a lot of 3D in real time in Webflow with 3JS. Nice. You, you might have seen a lot of clonables from Federico on Webflow. He got really cool clonables on Webflow. So go and check that out. Link will gonna be in the description. And in this session, we're going to cover how to bring 3D model into Webflow. This session is about this, but the entire series is going to be covered how to bring animated model, how to bring the model from Blender into 3D and make it animated and interactive. Yes, I think we're going to cover um, kind of the whole pipeline from zero to uh, what you should do in Blender, how should you set up a scene, how does the scene work in browser, how to interact with it, how to bring in animation, how to bring in effects, post-processing, and everything that you can want to do by doing 3D with code inside of Webflow. That's it, sweet. I'm pretty sure people would be super interested knowing like, why not Spline? Like there is a Spline, great update. They just released update where you can use triggers and it works great like from the first look so why did we not use spline for things side? i think yes as we were talking even when we were actually developing the things with website in 3d like can we use spline what can we do and i think it's always right as an option to consider and i think again with the latest updates spline has probably done one of the most incredible work that has been done in quite some time the issue there is always there's a few points like you, by choosing Spline as a route, you will be forever locked into what Spline allows you and does not allow you to do. And this is a, the first and, and kind of bigger thing for me, at least. And for more complex websites where you want to have a lot more control over what's happening and be able to, to get in and do maybe crazier things, I think uh, doing it like getting your hands dirty with code is probably uh, the best option or also, also the only option at the moment. Another thing might be performance. With Spline, in a lot of cases, you tend to end up needing more than one canvas to render your 3D um, scenes because you might have more than one and you want to sync it and you want to move it with scroll and so on. And this is one of the reasons why you, you never want more than one instance of these kind of things running. So this is another good reason why you, why we decided to keep it uh, in 3JS and basically in almost native WebGL in browser. I think this is pretty important that you have to have only one instance. Uh, we used to experiment with Spline and we placed like two, three instances of Spline. And that was weird because performance was awful. Like everything was really slow, you know, uh, that was weird. So this is important information. Keep one instance if you do use Spline. This is like nice tip. Thank you. There's got to be a lot of 3D in browser. 3D in browser is running on something that's called WebGL, which the great thing of WebGL is that's GPU accelerated, meaning it goes really fast and can go really smooth. One thing it doesn't do that well is translates really good through Zoom calls. So also when you're doing work and you review things on uh, on calls with clients, that tend to be like the, it looks quite choppy and you're like, no, 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 you should go to the link because uh, it's not going to translate well you're on a call. So I hope I'm it's not like, too choppy. I'm looking at GIF, right? It's just like one, yeah, two, exactly. three frame this weird. So, so yeah, for, for sure. When you go to like the production side, it's like smooth and yeah. nice and all cool. Yeah. Sweet. Also, uh, let's jump in straight into what we're going to do today. 
then you can get to a presentation. So <clears throat> also the presentation is kind of in 3D. I try to keep it as uh, less 3D as possible. So we get the wow effect, but at the same time, again, should translate reasonably well in the, in the Zoom call. So hopefully you can follow the text is normal. So I think we're going through a little bit of a context and how this kind of stuff work in the browser really briefly without getting into technical side of things and getting like in complex stuff and just, so we keep it really simple and straightforward. We kind of describe what we will be going to do in the second part, which is actually going to be getting a 3D model up and running in browser with a little bit of option for like movement and events and customization. The purpose of the session is to bring 3D model into Webflow. We are not going to do um, advanced animation, but you will get triggers. Like you can move objects, you can spin objects, you can zoom, pan, all that beautiful stuff you can do with 3D, uh, you will get it because this is 3D. This is the whole point of 3D that is interactive. This is not just a video. Yeah, exactly. One of the f most important thing, I think, is there's always a little bit of a trade-off when doing this kind of things in terms of 3D is going to be most likely less precise and less high fidelity than a video rendered really specifically for a specific use. But like, you can get pretty close you can get effects and things and the main point of uh the main point of a using 3d in browser is interactivity because it makes instead of you you just looking at a screen playing a video you, you're actually inside of what we a lot of time call an experience like this could easily be a video like a looping video but if it was a video you could not move it like you wanted and this is one of the main things so what we will be talking about is 3D in Webflow using 3JS. Why 3JS? The, the main uh, objective of 3D in general is the process of rendering. Also, like in 3D is, is technically called rendering. Ultimately, it's representing, visualizing some graphical content in three-dimensional space. So you have, and what is 3D? in the browser, 3D in the browser is representing those 3D and rendering those meshes in real time, hopefully, in browser. So real time is kind of the keyword here because there's not that many limitations, but you should always be kind of uh, concerned with how much power are you, you are consuming and how does your animation play? But again, we will be using WebGL, which is a pretty powerful API. And what's an API? It means it's, a, well, it's an application programming interface, but basically means that in your browser, baked in, like built with your browser, with the software of your browser, there's stuff you can access through JavaScript, for example, and 3 yet. WebGL is actually baked in. 3JS is a library built on top of it and makes WebGL a nice experience to develop because WebGL is a really, really, really old in terms like an in internet age, but API and is like really complex, extremely difficult. So uh, a, a person known as Mr. Doob long time ago started this gigantic project that turned out as one of the the most interesting libraries, JavaScript libraries on the web. It's called 3JS, which is a, basically a wrapper that makes programming in WebGL easier. How does it work in general? So what you're going to have in when you do 3D things are like objects in space that you're going to represent somehow. And what 3JS and WebGL does is basically take those objects and like squeeze them as a flat blade that's actually going to be the canvas. And the canvas is the object that's going to allow you to render things in browser. So you take 3D objects and you basically are going to render them as if they were uh, flat on a screen. So you, you are going to provide the canvas, some WebGL is going to provide the canvas 
the information on how this 3D object is going to look when you're going to look at it. So this might be a bit confusing right now. So you're going to need a few things. And there's two main parts to all of this. So you're going to need first a world, a kind of a place that's going to wrap your old scene and it's going to describe how uh, your world is going to look. So it's basically going to be the context from where you're going to be observing. So it, it's going to have information like how far can you look? How close can you look? How defined do you look? How large is your vision? And all this kind of thing. And then inside of this world, you're going to want to have some objects. So objects that are going to be the thing you will be observing, basically. So these two parts compose every WebGL program. So again, the outside is like your reference place. They're going to have, like in most 3D softwares, also in browser, you're going to have axis. So it's going to be like the 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 X axis, the uh, Y axis, which is going to be the vertical in 3D, and the Z axis, which is going to be your depth. It's a bit different, like a lot of 3D software kind of inverts the Y and Z. So just the thing to keep in mind. And it's basically going to be, again, representing and describing our point of view. And then you're going to have objects. Objects are going to be the thing we're going to observe. So those are going to be composed. Every object, every thing that you're representing in 3D space on the web is going to be called a mesh. So it's like a object that's composed of two parts, which are the geometry. That's the thing that describes how the mesh is constructed. So all the kind of rectangles you see here in three dimension, this is how the mesh look. And a material that's what is going to take that information and tell the, the pixels on the screen how those kind of positions in 3D space are going to be represented. Now, why is this important? Because this stuff at the moment does not exist and we will have to make it from scratch using the FilmSuite developer starter, a little bit of code, and a little bit of JavaScript. Wait, wait, wait. You said FilmSuite developer starter, right? That's like, can, can, can you explain more? Or you, you can do it when you go. And actually, I just wanted to say that it was like mind blowing when you showed that cube when we were inside of a cube and you just rotated the cube. And there is another cube. I was like, oh, whoa. Okay, I didn't expect that. That's like 3D is really, really awesome and surprising sometimes. Yeah, I think one of the really good things of doing 3D and not actually working with real space is that you can kind of extend reality. Like with photographs, yes, you can, but it's going to be a little bit trickier. Like with 3D, you can actually do things that don't exist in real life and fully masquerade stuff and so on. And I think a great points where 3JS and WebGL in general excel in creative development experience online is exactly this. So the the ability to 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 express the story you want to tell, the brand you want to tell, the everything you want to tell with like with more than a two-dimensional plane, but just like giving more depth to to the story you are talking. And yes, I, I took a lot of time with this slide. <laughs> because I, I actually enjoyed this, the effect where it comes up. So it looks so simple and awesome. This is really cool. It's like, you know, what you can do with simple stuff. You never expect, you see like, oh, I can do this like with fake 3D in Webflow, like just turning surfaces, like, you know, like you do with CSS. And then like, no, 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 there is no way you can do this like in CSS. So... We do it in Webflow. So the first thing we need is a Webflow project. We need a Webflow project with a very specific uh, element that uh, is going to be, again, what we were saying before is 3D uh, works inside of an HTML element. It's called a canvas. So a canvas uh, is a specific, like, uh, an HTML element like is an actual real thing that exists in uh, 
in modern HTML and also in quite old HTML. Though, when working with 3JS, you don't want to get uh, straight to the, like you're not gonna do directly the canvas. Sorry. You could do this, but 3JS provides a couple of utilities that basically do this uh, automatically and for your convenience. So you, the only thing you're gonna really need is a way to reference and select the object. In this case, uh, we are using, we will be using a, an attribute and I, I just called it data-3D equals C that stands for canvas. And we have a little bit of a, we have a little bit of a CSS that targets this class and basically tells you that's going to be, well, the border we're just going to use to debug. If you would just create another like div, native div in web form, and you just give it a like attribute data 3D scene, that's going to be the same, right? Same. That's going to be the same. The only thing that I not sure you can do it in Webflow is the box sizing. Right. Natively. I mean, but I think. I mean, not, not I the do style. This. I mean, only the div, like with attribute styles for sure. Yeah, but yeah, I I think though, probably with the only exception being the box styling, you can do everything else in in directly web. I think I do this just out of uh, like, I'm used to do it like this. And so. Oh, sh <laughs> sure, sure. Keep, keep going. Start keep going. <laughs> by myself. And also, it, it might help you sometimes because you, you might want to end up when you, when, when you, deploy the project to maybe like remove the touch uh, actions or mess with the ability to click on top of it and so on. So yes, this would be, this is the way I do it almost every time. We use this just for convenience and because we don't want to uh, pollute with the, with like not style related classes, the, the structure. So I think this is in general quite convenient. Using attributes is more, more convenient because classes always you can mess up with class. Someone will start adding some styles on top of the class. When you use attribute, it's like you sure that it will not mess up, not like somebody will not mess up with your uh, project. So what you're gonna need then is to access the amazing work uh, that Alex has done, <laughs> which allows you to develop locally in your VS Code and while actually having a, a, a nice experience, because I think he quite recently added live reload, which was probably one of the biggest pain you could have. So we're going to be using the things we develop as stats are, we're going to be using VS code. You want to have, as Alex uh, explains to you in this thing that you're going to need PNPM, which uh, everything here is like, like is, is really well uh, described how to get up and running. So I think for what's concerning the things with developer starter, I'd, I'd leave you to that. The only thing is how you actually get it. So you can easily just download the zip file or if you have uh, Git installed, you can copy this and open a terminal. Now I using um, iTerm, which is kind of a different shell on top of a terminal, just because it's going to be a little bit better for me to showcase things, but you can use like the native uh, Mac terminal and on Windows, I, I suppose you should have a terminal. Now, <laughs> so there's going to be a couple of comments you, you're going to need to know, which are going to be uh, the how to navigate. So I have a few stuff installed because I do this uh, in lots of other reasons, but once you open the terminal, you want to do CD, which is going to allow you to get inside of a directory. So, and you can just drag a folder on top of it and you're going to be inside of a folder. You can do LS and for example, list everything that's in the folder, though this is not needed. The CD and drag a folder on top of it and you're going to get there. Now, if you've used the, uh, the download zip, you should just get into this thing. Uh, otherwise, you're going to copy this if you have git installed and you want to do git clone. I might be getting, no, okay, yeah, it's good. And what this is going to do is going to put 
the developer starter inside of my folder. So I just copied the project from Alex from GitHub. Next step, you want to get into that folder. So CD, mm, no, let's do it like this. Because otherwise I'm gonna have a lot of stuff because I downloaded quite some time. So you want to rename this folder, traditional style, we do it live one. So you want to CD into live dash, dash one. And if you ls again, just to confirm you're in the correct folder, you're gonna see bin, package, JSON, playwright, and so on. So now you are in the folder, in the correct folder. And so you want to follow the instruction that are provided here. So first thing is bnpm install. And this is gonna real fast install everything that Alex provided for us in here. And after that, if you have installed VS code, you can do code dash dot. And this is gonna open an instance of VS code in your, uh, where you can work and do whatever you need to do. Now, you have installed- But you have to have VS code before, right? So you have to- You will have to have VS code, yes. And then yes. with this command line, you will get to open yeah, it, VS Code. Yeah, it opens VS Code. In case VS Code doesn't open with code dash dot, what you can do is just open VS Code manually and again, drag the folder inside of VS Code and you're going to be exactly where, where I am right now. So in an instance of VS Code with uh, everything, but not everything installed. So what do we need to install? We need to install 3JS. So again, in the same terminal window, you can do pnpm install 3. 3 JS is just called 3. Uh, and you're going to have that installed. And then what you can do is npm run dev. And yeah, sorry, Alex. This is really good when it's formatted correctly. My terminal is too big right now, but this is great. And what this is going to provide you, and this is why I think this tool is amazing, is this. You get the import suggestion. So you can take this, get back in your Webflow project, go into the code section for body with the defer. I think Alex may suggest to put it in the head, in the defer tag. Works the same in our case. Uh, but yeah, still. You're gonna put your uh, live um, code here. You're gonna save it. You're gonna publish. And what we will see, so this file works that it starts from here. So what we should see in the console is the greet user function calling and saying hello to us. So if we go here and we open the console, this is actually working. So when you uh, change the code, uh, the console is not going to be happy. So I change the code and it auto refreshes. And this is really important if you want to develop uh, inside of Webflow. This is one of the main uh, pain points. So we now have an instance of VS Code that we can actually interact and use with this Webflow project. And this is the main thing. So I will do just for my sanity, I will remove the ESLint config. So, because we're gonna use the console a lot. And right now it complains when, uh, like it, it does the red squigglies, which are not fun. And in the, I think I also going to switch to a JavaScript file. And so I'm gonna have to get in the thing and this part of the script that actually rebuilds the code and change the entry point to JavaScript. This you can just copy exactly as I did if you don't want it. So now that I've removed the ESLint, it doesn't give me the error and the warning on the console. But apart from that, we are ready to do some 3D in Webflow. So I think we can remove this function. And the first thing you're gonna have to do, and this is another uh, it's not a good reason to do to use 
uh, like VS Code and a terminal and a bundler is that you can actually import and export modules without needing to link a lot of CDNs um, other than the code. So because we previously uh, installed three, we now have three inside of our project. And what we can do, and it's the same way you're going to see it in the documentation in Suena is, and so on, is going to be import star as three from three. And so we now have a named variable we can use everywhere inside of the project. So if, for example, we console the log, uh, well, I don't know what's going to happen here. Yeah, I've done something. Oh, yeah, sorry. I, I think I... Uh, oh. I don't know. Index.js. Yes. Entry point is index.js. Yes. I think I need to restart. Uh, again, npm run dev. And this should be fixed. Yes, sorry. I I needed... To, when, when you do changes in like this file that are kind of the, the build files, you, you always want to restart your terminal and re re have your server running as a fresh, uh, in a fresh session, basically. But yes, and we have an, an object that's called three. There's a lots, lots and lots and lots and lots of stuff inside of it. Now this and getters. But uh, yes, this is the whole 3JS library. So, I think we're ready to start in implementing some 3D models in the browser. We want to start doing a uh, 3D scene. As we were talking in the presentation, we're going to have like two phases in this. So the first phase is going to be creating the context or the world we sit in. And it's going to be composed of three things. So you're going to have a renderer, you're going to have a camera, and you're going to have a scene. And these are kind of the first three pieces of things we need to build. So I think we want to build uh, a function. Sorry. Uh, let's call it init3d that we can call from inside here to init the 3D thing. Now, now yeah, thanks, Copilot. Spoiled all the fun. Yes. But uh, you don't need to write code. It's done. <laughs> we, we, we're going to do it yeah. manually, but we can save this because, again, I think in general for 3.js, uh, what you want to do when you develop 3.js is you actually want to refer to the documentation. Like, 3.js is a lot of stuff in it, and no one expects you to know them, everything by heart. You just want to kind of learn what terms and what you should Google and just Google things. So the first thing we want to do is to call this function when Webflow is ready. So we call this as init3d. We can remove this console log, for example, and maybe uh, move it inside of here and say uh, init3d. 3D is working. Again, I'm, I'm terrible at typing on the console, but we, we just need to know that something is happening and the whole thing is working. So as we said, the first thing we want to do is to get our div. So const, we can call it whatever. I call it viewport. It's going to be document.querySelector, but we want to select the thing we did uh, earlier with the attribute. So data-3D equals C, which is the element in Webflow that we created earlier. So this is an attribute. To select an attribute, you're gonna you need to use the the square brackets. So now we should have the viewport somewhere. So viewports. So we we are having our div that's the wrapper that's gonna be the wrapper for our canvas. Now the things you will want is again a render, a camera, and a scene. So the first thing is const yeah done. Let's do it first. But is 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 correct? Yeah, I feel like I'm stupid to to type this. 
So again, I have it. Oh no, yeah, I have uh, WebGL render. So the renderer is in the same namespace we imported and it's called WebGL renderer. For now, I think we can just leave it like this. We want to be wanting to do two things though. The, yeah. So renderer dot set size because the renderer doesn't really know about the external world. Like the renderer doesn't know about the HTML world basically. So we're going to have to provide the renderer a little bit of information. And what I want to do though, instead of what Copilot was trying to do is I want to use the viewport and I want to use the client width and the viewport.client height. Our viewport is this. So the client width and the client height is the with the height that are going to be displayed in the uh, HTML. So this tells us that our renderer is going to be the correct size, basically. So sorry, I just closed the on the side part. So we got a little bit more space. So we got a renderer. Now we need a camera. So again, constant camera equals, ah, oh God, I'm not doing any work here. So a camera, a perspective camera in 3JS holds a few values. You have a field of view, which is, we're going to play around with it a little bit later so I can explain this a little bit better. But if you think about like photography, for example, uh, this is basically going to be what kind of uh, lens are you using? Like this is a kind of a 75 millimeter lens. You, you're going to realize they're not exactly one-to-one, -one, but if you're going to do 20, uh, 25, you're going to have a, a wider lens. And if you end up doing 120, you can have like a more of like a telephoto lens. So something that is like a bit more, a bit narrower and like, and, and this is going to actually change, uh, the perception of the space we're going to have. This is the aspect ratio. So again, is the width divided by the height. So it just needs to know that. And then there's, let's do it above, uh, aspect ratio, we're going to have, um, the yeah, thank you. I can even type comments far. It needs to be faster than it. So near and far means when the camera considers objects to be inside of its view and in relative units to the 3JS world, this is going to be 0.1 and 100. In general, if you don't have specific needs, you can just, you can leave it like that for most of the cases, it's not going to be bad or difficult, but in general, you want to like the, the smaller this is, the faster the application is going to run. So don't do it during development maybe, but when you're ready to launch and you have the scene is complete, you want to try and find and try and squeeze it as much as possible just to squeeze out every bit of performance you can get. So guy, do you want to say something? I'm just amazed how you do it. And is that going to be like default value that you would use for every project that you start? Kind of. I like right now we're building a code that I've not written in probably five years, just because there's a little bit of what's called boilerplate code, like starter code. So right. like I have, I keep and maintain a few starters that all oh, this code is kind of already in there and prepped. And I just go in and I kind of, I might change the, the, the field of view. I might change uh, a few things, but like most of this code, you kind of do it once you save it. And then you just modify the other part, basically. So first thing we need is the scene. So constant scene equals, again, thank you, Copilot. We're not going to be doing any, any work here. <laughs> but I, I'll, I'll try my best to at least. Yeah. See, this is just following me. So we now have those three things. But if I save it, nothing is happening. Well, nothing is happening for two reasons. So reason one is we're not actually rendering anything. So I would say this is expected, but reason two is right now we still have just our div. See, there's no canvas inside of here. So, uh, 3JS has a convenient way to, as we were saying before, so we get back to the renderer. So this is going to be, uh, okay. Thank you. Viewports dot append child. So. 
the viewport we have selected is going to get the child, which is going to be the renderer. Like, it, what you see is happening now is now 3JS has, has put a canvas inside of the, um, inside of our, our div element. So now we actually do have a canvas there. And this is the, the canvas HTML element that we were talking about earlier. Now you might see some things like the data engine, the spectral context type. Don't worry about those. This is like extension stuff I have installed because I do this a lot. And I kind of, uh, I like debugging things and similar. So, so you're adding a canvas that. to DOM with JavaScript, right? Yes. We are starting, we are selecting the viewport. We are appending a child from the viewport, which is going to be the, the, the DOM representation of the renderer. So if, if you want just to console.log this, so if I console log the renderer, which is this thing we are working with. Is a WebGL renderer, which is an actual thing. And somewhere in here, there's going to be a DOM element. There might not be. Still, what he's doing is... Yeah, I see it. I see it. This yeah, is yeah, an I see canvas. It. DOM element, and this is a canvas. So it basically, is like if you were doing like document.createElement and you create any element, you can create also canvas. This is basically what's happening here. Uh, let's not construct this anymore. Uh, what we are doing is like this, and this is another standard thing you do, is just put a canvas inside of our viewport element, and we're going to have a canvas so we can actually do things. And this is great. So we are at 50%. Uh, like this is what we were describing earlier as a representation of the world here we are in. So it has a way to see. It has uh, something that's going to allow you to see. I think the, the, the kind of metaphor kind of goes away at some point. With the world, it becomes a bit more trickier. But this is, this is the context. This is the, the general thing. And now we have the second part of this, which is going to be creating something that we can actually look at. And so this is, let's just especially if we're going to provide this code. So we want the object. An object, as we said, again, thank you, Copilot, is composed by a geometry. And a box is going to be a good geometry to start with. Thanks, Copilot. Again, all those things are inside of 3JS, and you can just uh, 3JS geometry and get really well done documentation so you can find everything like geometry, Create, and you're going to find all the potential geometry you might want to use. This is a note, going to be quite important if someone wants to. So, he wants to do it. So, just Google 3JS and what you're looking for, and you're going to find it most likely. So, the second thing we need is a material. So, const material. Material. I've done. I thought I'm going to use not a mesh basic material, but I'm going to use a mesh normal material. I'm using the autocomplete function here. The mesh normal material is the same material you've seen in the presentation. It's kind of a debug material that's going to tell you what the normals are. And the first thing you want to do with these two information is create a mesh containing the box geometry and the mesh normal material. And the last thing you want to do here is going to be to add this mesh to the scene we have created, which is here. So. Thank you. I, it just knows it. So all of this is good. The only thing that's missing, and I think if you want to go fast, I can take this here. I'm going to comment it in a second. So this is going to be the, the, the so-called rendering function. So a rendering function, let's just not do that, is a function that you call with potential modifications if you want to do to the scene. And like this is a renderer, and we're telling him to render, which is not working. This is a super typical error that you're going to find in lots of time and time again when you start doing this. And is the issue we have right now is that you th oh, um, if you think of 3D space, we are adding things, but our camera is actually in the position 0, 0, 0. So which is the same position where this cube is. So what we need to do is 
Oh God. Camera dot position dot Z equals five. And now we have the actual cube in the middle of the screen. Nice. You need to make sure that the camera is actually looking at the scene because for example, if, if the camera is going to be rotated in the Y axis, this is going to be a radiant. So don't get confused a lot. You're not going to see anything, but the thing is actually working. The, the, the issue is that you're actually be looking at the wrong thing. And this is a thing that happens quite often while doing 3JS things. So yes, this is a good debugging thing. So the first thing you do after creating a camera usually is moving it back a bit. So you're actually looking at stuff. Let's just add some controls because right now nothing is happening. Now Arbit controls is a, a dependency that you're going to have to import with this exact link. And this is just, you're going to find the documentation and you can just like copy and paste it because it's, it comes as an add-on and is not in there by default because you might not want it uh, every time. So you're just going to look for uh, 3JS Arbit controls and you're going to see all the ways to import stuff from the documentation. But the controls are one of the most important thing for two reasons. First, to debug the scene and then to add the first layer of interactivity, basically. So what is this interactivity and how do we use it? So we want to, at some point, create the controls. Thank you. Perfect. So the controls takes, so this look that we are importing as a separate thing and not from here. So you're going to use it without the, pref the prefix. So. This is the Arbit controls. Takes two uh, information, both the camera and the render at the element. And then what we want to do is refresh the controls in the inside of the loop. So controls, this is what they're going to allow you to do. You're going to get the zoom. You're going to get spins. You're going to have, you will be able to move around the scene. And this is one way to interact and have the scene animate. A different way to have the scene animate and like generate them at the same time is like inside of this function that's called once it's called 60 times a second thanks to this function that calls itself basically so we keep on calling it every time and every frame so every time and every frame you can modify the property for example the position or the rotation of the cube is this clear i i fear I might be getting a bit too, f I might be going a little bit too fast, <laughs> but that's cool. That's cool. But, uh, okay. So when, how exactly you get this, like you rotating all the time and how you can control this rotation. So there's a function again is like, it, it, it should be in the window. So it's like a function again, another thing that's built in the browser and it's a request animation frame function. So we're creating a new function called calling in this case animate because Copilot decided like that. So inside of this function, we basically call this thing that makes it loop and makes it call the animate function, which is itself. So, and this just one every uh, calls one every 60, six, six, yeah, thank you. Also the English is better than mine. So I'm going to trust him at this. So this function just makes it that this call itself. This is another like classical thing, even like uh, if you do 3JS basic setup, setup, and you just go here, you're going to see basically exactly this. You're going to have a scene, a camera, a renderer. You're going to have this, and then you have the request animation frame loop. So this is kind of also the basics. Like this is thing you need to know and, and just do this. And inside of this, you will be rendering your scene. So what happens is you, you, you call the render method on your render and you tell him to render the scene through the camera. And then inside of here, you can do uh, all the modifications you want to the current space. So you can cube rotation, you can, uh, you can do, and you, you can move the camera, you can update time value and make things move. You can move the whole scene based on the scroll. If you listen to the scroll and you have this value in here. So this is the place where your loop 
or game loop because it's actually taken from the uh, like game kind of type logic. So you have this kind of loop that runs constantly and it's going to allow you to render the scene. Nice. See, for example, just to get a little bit of a recap on that, if you change the field of view, you're going to get super close. If you get more like a telephoto lens, you're going to get further away. And this is like, for example, how the camera works and so on. But yeah, for a, 3D, a custom 3D model, that does a little bit of things we will need to talk about. We want to bring like real 3D model, not just rotating cube, right? Like this is like normal. This is like simple model that you can see. You, you correct me yeah. because you, you thought this is not a real model. You didn't model this cube inside of the yeah. blender. Well, this is a right. So in blender, you would you would generate, like you would create in Blender some uh, cool 3D models and then you prepare it and you would move it with 3GS into the web flow. And uh, actually the entire point of the sessions were was like to bring the real 3D like we did with actually with our website, with Finspot website, where you had like the models. What we did on the web flow on Finspot side, we had models being prepared inside of the blender with all the animations. So all the animations being yep. done inside of the blender, right? And then Federico, he built all the bones for the animals. He connected them to the animals and we are controlling, we're in control of all the animations of those animals. So when you move your mouse, the tiger will follow the mouse with his head. And we're also in control yep. so, of like walking and everything. I think what we can do real quick uh, instead of like doing this manually, I can just copy and paste the example I practiced on earlier. So we actually see yeah. the 3D model and maybe we can also provide this as a clone. So this is basically the same code, but you're seeing this dude. And this is the model we're going to be working on and it, in the end it's going to be animated. So what changed? I imported the, the 3GS is the same. Arbit controls are the same we had before. I imported two other utilities from 3GS called GLTF loader and the texture loader. I'm calling the same function. I'm selecting the viewport. I am creating the scene, rendering the camera. It, but instead of adding the cube that I just commented out, like the cube we had before is still there, but it was a little bit in the way. So I removed it. I'm importing the controls. I'm adding a couple of properties on the controls to make it auto rotate without me needing to touch it and to add a little bit of dampening. So when I spin it, it doesn't like abruptly stop, but this is kind of the same thing. Like if I just remove those, we're going to be exactly where we were before. So the function is the same as the controls update and renders, but then it has this thing that's, these are two utility functions that load one, the texture, one, the model using the two things I imported, but they do it in, in an async way. So these two functions return a promise so I can call them from uh, here. So I have a function that's called load and I have updated both the model and the texture are actually uh, inside of here. So the texture is just a PNG and the model, I just to keep it on webflow, you can take a .glb file, which is a format for a 3D model and rename it as a TXT. So this you're gonna find in the clonable as well. This is amazing because you can host all the textures yeah. and file inside of Webflow itself. Yeah, I think at one point, at least with the 3D model, the, the TXT might actually become too large for that. <laughs> yes. Probably not really, really optimal, but for this demo and for lots of stuff, it's going to be uh, quite nice. So again, I'm calling this utility function to load with the links of the stuff that the they take a link, they do all the things that they need to do, and they return me uh, inside of this asset object. They, I think, I'm calling the load, and this function ultimately comes back with the robot loaded and the texture loaded. Texture is loaded just really quickly. I think we're going to talk more about those stuff, but the point is, it's not just loading an image. You have to take this image, make it into something that the GPU can read and upload it to the GPU. So again, 
Uh, there's a little bit of stuff. You, you don't really need to understand those. You just need to know that if you have an image, you need to make it into a texture. And if you have a model, you need to load it. And what happens then is like, since this is a sync, I can call like this works. This does what it needs to do and wait for it to finish. And when it's finished, does this keyword then I can, for example, I'm right now in console logging the robot that is represented by like my assets that come back are group, which contains an object that's our model. So there's a skinned mesh because it has the bones and we will use the bones. But and it has a texture. A texture is, is not an image, like the image is actually stored uh in inside of here, but is a is a format that the GPU can read. So uh good. And what is happening then is I'm I'm iterating over because as we've seen this is a group, it's not directly a mesh. So I need to assign a material. So I'm just giving it a basic material, which is a material that doesn't reflect the light, and then I'm mapping the texture to the material based on UV coordinates. And then I'm adding this robot with the texture as the map of his material. And that's why we see it in 3D online. I think most likely also quite fast. So this is 60 frames per second. So it runs smoothly in browser. It doesn't get smoother than that. It's actually running faster, but the fact that I'm using an external monitor uh, and also 99% of the people looking at the web are going to have yes. uh, sure. <laughs> like their Chrome, their Chrome is going to be capped. Like your browser is not going to get faster than 60 FPS, but you can unlock it from, you can unlock it from the Chrome flags, but, but you really don't need to do it also because it becomes, everything becomes more complicated, but this is, uh, loading a 3D model in browser. I think if we, in the next session, maybe we start a little bit more. Uh, hands-on a bit faster and we can get through what's happening here. But again, yeah, absolutely. This... this first step is very important for people to understand how to get the 3D model into the web flow. So this first step is like, you know, a lot of people struggling with making the first step. When you do the first step, then your code will get more and more advanced every time when you get back. Yes, like all of this code, you, you want to write once, try to understand it, but then you're just going to have to copy and you're just going to copy and paste in different projects. So like even like this stuff that might sound scary. And if you're not really that fluent in JavaScript, this actually is scary, but like this I made for you and for myself as well. So you can just copy and you just know that this function takes an URL and gives you back a model in an async way. So like it might be scary, but you don't need to understand everything. You need to understand parts of it and we kind of work our way up to this. Thank you guys for being here, for watching this video, spending time with FinSuite and Federico. And we're gonna continue this uh, series of from zero to 3D in Webflow with animation. If you like the video, hit that like button, subscribe to our channel, stay tuned for more video like that. And also leave in comments what you want to learn about 3D more. Federico, any last words you wanna say to the crowd? But yes, thank you, Sergei. Thank you, FinSuite, for having me. And uh, I hope you enjoyed this session. It was really fun for me. And we'll see each other hopefully soon with more 3D in Webflow.